That clock did not go off. Nice job, all. Is it me or is it the blueprint for the pathway to policy solutions so clear after hearing those trends? I would like the people in Washington and our state capitals to hear these things. Um, at any rate, we just had a great discussion of what's happening in housing at the national level. Now we're going to turn the microscope to a specific microcosm, um, Detroit itself. To help us examine what's happening in the Motor City, we have two outstanding contributors. Please extend a warm welcome to former HUD secretary, and I had the pleasure to work closely with him, and I can tell you different sides of the aisle. There was not a person I had uh, a better relationship with and was more outcome-oriented than Henry Cisneros, former San Antonio mayor and CEO of City View Companies, as well as Bill Emerson, vice chairman of Rock Holdings, which is the parent company of Quicken Loans and a whole bunch of other fintech firms. Thanks so much. Take it away. Rick, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Thanks for serving as the master of ceremonies today. But most importantly, thank you for your good work in the housing field for a lot of years. It was 1994, middle of the Clinton administration. I was Secretary of Housing. And um, the uh, Contract for America had just uh, won the election of 1994. And it was a very, very contentious period. There was a period when uh, the leadership of the House uh, Newt Gingrich would not talk to cabinet members in the uh, Clinton administration, but I had a friend who knew him well, and that was Rick Lazio. And Rick uh, walked me in, took me in to see the speaker about uh, a special request, which was that the House cooperate in funding for the first time with governmental funding, Habitat for Humanity, which had never accepted governmental money, but they needed it for infrastructure purchases of pipe and such to build housing in large, large scale. Uh, when I walked in with Rick Lazio, the speaker was wearing a Habitat for Humanity pin. So that started the meeting on a good note. Uh, and, and, we, and we were able to do that and it set Habitat in a new direction. But the key guy in making that possible was this man, Rick Lazio, who, has not only, who not only acquitted himself exceedingly well over the years when he headed the key committees, but has stayed involved in the housing field today. Let's hear it for Rick Lazio and his uh, leadership over many years. And also, uh, I want to just personally thank Ron Terwilliger for, uh, uh, for, for the immense dedication consistently over the years to the cause of affordable housing. It's rare to find an American who has succeeded at the level that he has, and I understand uh, you, know, you can measure that in different ways, but one of them is 200,000 units of apartments built when he was the chairman of Trammell Crow Residential, hundreds of millions of dollars, and yet to have such a deep empathy and caring for the plight of Americans who live in, in cost burden situations uh, is really, really rare. Uh, he's been very unselfish with his time, with his money. Uh, he claims to be retired, but this is what's called retirement for him. Uh, <laughs> You greeted him already uh, and evidenced your respect when we greeted him earlier, but please join me again in just saying thanks to Ron Terwilliger. So this is a very, very good conference. Just looking at the program, that first session, you can tell the substance of what we're going to cover today. And many of you, of course, are, are, are partners in the national uh, community of housers. Uh, important, important role in our society. So today's focus is on national issues, but we are in Detroit, and that was a conscious choice uh, to highlight things that are happening in a city that may have been to the low point of where American cities can go. After Katrina, people said, uh, we are about to lose an American city. Well, we didn't in New Orleans. Uh, but people also said that about Detroit after the bankruptcy here and the bankruptcy of General Motors and that low period of 2008, 2009, 2010. Luckily, there were some very, very good people in Detroit, um, including new public leadership and new private leadership. Philanthropic leadership like Rip Rapson, who you heard from earlier, 
it's become a kind of a legend, a kind of a template for how you bring a city back to get those three elements of society involved. Uh, Detroit once had two million people. It now has about 650,000 people and is growing again, but uh, maybe 5,000 people a year or so, so it would be a long, long time before it ever gets close to what it once was. The national poverty rate is 14%, that's high. Detroit's is 36% today. Um, so the, 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 the city has been to a very low point and is building back, but it is a long slog and very, very, very tough. We have the privilege today of having one of the people who has personally been involved in Detroit, but also who has headed a company that is itself almost legendary, not only for how rapidly it's grown and what it's done in the housing field, but what it's done in Detroit. Quicken Loans is the company. It uh, has done $300 billion worth of mortgages in our country. It's the second largest originator of mortgages in America, headquartered here in Detroit. Uh, Dan Gilbert is the, uh, the, the, the founder, uh, but Bill Emerson was the CEO of Quicken Loans for all of those years. Fifteen years he served as CEO, and uh, those were the growth years for, for, for Quicken. During those years, uh, J.D. Powers named it the outstanding servicer of mortgages in the country, the outstanding originator of mortgages on quality criteria. Uh, Bill um, has been the chairman of the Mortgage Bankers Association nationally, uh, the Financial Services Roundtable Housing Policy Council. He's active in the Detroit Economic Club and has received some of the highest awards that a business person can get for philanthropy from the ALS Association, active in the Alzheimer's Association, and the Salvation Army. Uh, he is smart, tough, everybody will tell you that. I suspect in part at least it is due to the fact that he was a running back for the Penn State football team. He played in the national championship game in 1982, the first national championship for Penn State. And so once you've carried a football into the heart of Big Ten defenses, you probably can do anything in the country and certainly uh, help in the turnaround of Detroit is one of those. So Bill, let's start the conversation. Just tell us a little bit about the Quicken story, if you could, because I think it's an important uh, thing to understand the scale of the company. I understand Quicken has uh, bought something on the order of 90 buildings in downtown Detroit and, and is, is, is alluring not only its own vendors and suppliers but other companies and, and almost willing uh, downtown Detroit back into vibrancy. Well, tell, us, tell us a little bit about the thinking there. Happy to do so. First of all, um, it's great to be here. I'm glad this conference is in the city of Detroit, so thank you all for coming. By the way, is it possible for me to hire you as my introductory <laughs> human for the rest of my career? Sure. I've never heard a better introduction. Sure. I'm not even sure who that is, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, our story, um, we're a 32-year-old organization. Um, but, you know, it really, it starts probably for us in Detroit in 2010. Um, you know, we have always kind of taken a different view of the business. Um, and rocket mortgage was, was a completely different way to do business. And so we always thought differently about opportunity. And when we thought about Detroit, uh, we started talking about Detroit in 2008, 2009, and coming down, uh, down here and moving the headquarters um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, from a recruiting perspective, Detroit is very central to the area where we live. And so how do we recruit more and better talent? Um, we moved 1,700 people downtown in 2010. We made that decision. We, we, made, we came down lock, stock, and barrel. Um, Dan uh, Gilbert is born and raised in Detroit. His dad was a business owner in Detroit, small business owner, so obviously an affinity for this city. It's a, a, a great American city with incredible bones. Um, and, and just the opportunity for us to get involved in that um, looked as, as, as something that, you know, most people would have said, why? But it made total sense for us to do that. Today we have 17,000 team members living, working, and playing in Detroit. When we moved down here, we had 79 team members that lived in the city. We now have 34, 30, between 3,400 and 3,500 team members that live, work, and play in every neighborhood of this city. Uh, and so, you know, it's been uh, a great opportunity for us to interact with the city. Our team members, culture is very important to us, and our team members, um, one of the benefits that we've achieved is that 
A, we're downtown in a close proximity. We're a better business as a result of that because of our connectivity and our ability to communicate with one another. But our team members are so fired up about the, the ability to donate their time, effort, and energy to a great city like, uh, like Detroit. We'll do almost 150,000 volunteer hours this year alone um, in and, and around the community of Detroit. Uh, and that's a, that's a big, big uh, piece of the puzzle for our team members. So Bill, uh, what is the strategy? I mean, buying 90 buildings, big commitment. What, what, what's the underlying idea and where does it go? So when we came down here, obviously there was a lot of commercial real estate available. Um, and you know, we, we, have a, we, we developed this concept of for more than profit as an organization. You have profit, uh, for profit organizations, not for profit organizations. We looked in the middle and said, how can we take the profits that we have made and put them back into the community uh, and to try to be a catalyst uh, to start something? And commercial real estate was the first place to start downtown. Um, and we, you know, the first building we bought was the Madison building, a very old, iconic, beautiful building. Is that where you put the headquarters? No, it's, it, was a, it was a building that we, the headquarters actually where we moved into was uh, at that point called the CompuWare building. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Carmanos had built that building in 1999. When we first came down, we wanted to build. But as 08 and 09 happened, we realized the building was going to be problematic. So how do we get here earlier? So we moved into that building, which is now the One Campus Martius building. But we started with the Madison building. It's an old, iconic building. We rebuilt that, and that became more of like a, a corridor, a hub for technology companies to be able to come downtown. Mm -hmm. From there, it just cascaded into a, a variety of other commercial buildings. And the whole concept was, how do we take this beautiful, used to be a beautiful retail corridor up and down Woodward, and start thinking about how we can make that a beautiful uh, corridor again, wow. um, developing those buildings. Obviously, you know, we had many people that were moving into those buildings, but interestingly enough, I think people think that in all those buildings, we, we occupy most of it. We actually occupy about 35% of, of the space. We have been able to, in that process, recruit, retain, or create almost 200 businesses that now live, work, and play in the central business district downtown which in, you know, impacts tax revenues and a variety of other things that go into um, helping a city generate revenue and, and do things that are necessary from a services perspective. So you're the vice chairman of Rock Holdings, which is the holding company of which Quickens is a, Quicken is a part. Correct. And you have responsibilities for Quicken and other businesses that are part of Rock Holdings now. So you've obviously built businesses. Um, and to do that, you have to look ahead, some sort of vision of where, where you want them to be. What is your vision for what you believe Detroit will be? I mean, it's not going to be two million people again. That's, most people acknowledge that that's not gonna happen. But, but, but where is it? What, what do you think, not just in population, yeah. but, but the, the sense of Detroit? It once had, I think, 15 automobile plants in the city limits and now has three, I think. And um, uh, the, 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 the whole automotive uh, industry has changed so that what was once manufacturing in the United States is now research and design and a lot of that is in the right. suburbs. So what, visionarily, what is the essence of Detroit five years from now, ten years from now? So that's the crystal ball question, right? Um, never know what the crystal ball is going to look like. Um, I would tell you that, that when we think about the city of Detroit and, and where it's going, it's population stabilizing, um, we, have, we have a very unique opportunity here to make um, this entire city better, an inclusive one organism better. Uh, and so as we think about the future and what will happen in the next five years, um, there's, there's going to be a significant amount of development that continues to happen downtown. We are committed to uh, what can happen in the neighborhoods and starting to, to make sure that the neighborhoods are a part of that because you can't have a successful uh, Detroit with just having a successful downtown or just having a successful neighborhoods. Right. They've got to be able to work together. So I think in five years, you're gonna see um, continued growth uh, of the corridors. You're gonna see continued growth in the neighborhoods. I know the mayor has talked about starting to focus more time, effort, and energy in the neighborhoods. Yeah. We're committed to doing that. We have a variety of programs that we're involved with uh, in the neighborhoods. Um, and I think that, you know, who knows? I mean, are you doing quick in business, the milk mortgage business on a large scale in Detroit? I understand Detroit 10 years ago uh, issued 7000 mortgages as a city. Mm -hmm. And last year it was something like 700. Right. Um, so w how about how about the business side of this for quick in, in terms of mortgages in Detroit? So, uh, you know, mortgages in Detroit are, are a challenge um, for a variety of reasons. But primarily, if, if you take a look at the average sale price of a home in Detroit, it's about forty thousand dollars. So that's the average it means there's some that are less and, and some that are more. Uh, and so how do you start building um, a base that, that will allow that 
those comparables to increase and improve. We do lending in the city. We probably lend more than anybody in the city um, when you take a look at the data and the information. Uh, but we're also focused on trying to figure out the stabilization of neighborhoods. Uh, so one of the programs that we're involved in is called Rehabbed and Ready. And it's a program that allows us to be able to go into a neighborhood, um, start rehabbing homes. Um, we will work, we're working with the Home Depot to be able to rehab those homes. We have funded this uh, with our own money. Go in, rehab the home, and then put it on the open market. Um, and if there's a difference between what it costs you to fix it up, let's say it costs you all in 50 grand and you can sell it for 40. You gotta make up that difference of 10 to 15 grand to be able to do a normal mortgage. Right. We will make up that difference, allow the purchase price to come in, be able to get conventional financing on that um, in those neighborhoods. We've been able to help about 80 homes do that. Interestingly enough, in the, in the Bagley neighborhood, when we started Rehab and Ready, average sales price was $40,000. After 11 transactions, the average sales uh, price now is 90. So there is the opportunity to start moving the needle um, around the value of properties because that's, you know, that's, you know, a lot of times where wealth is created and right now that's difficult to be able to do here in the city of Detroit. You know, another, another piece of the puzzle that we're heavily involved in is the tax foreclosure process. Um, you know, blight has been a, a challenge in this city. Uh, Dan uh, chaired the blight task force uh, and, and evaluating the, the, the properties in the city and, and where some of that focus might, uh, might be. But tax foreclosure is the precursor to blight. And so every, you know, every year between 50 and 100,000 properties are targeted for the possibility of foreclosure. Not, not, not many of them go into that, mm -hmm. but we put together a program that will allow community groups to be able to go out and knock on. We're gonna go out and knock on 60,000 doors of folks who are, have missed one or two tax payments and educate them on what their options are so that we can keep people in their homes and allow that process to be able to continue to build itself. So, you know, lending in Detroit is, is something that it's, it's shifted and changed over the years. We're certainly not gonna solve it in a, in a couple, three year period, but we're trying to make the right moves um, necessary to, to bring back uh, the ability to lend in Detroit. Big part of the story, at least the, uh, as it's uh, conveyed in the national media, is the millennials who are coming uh, one version of the story is they can find uh, space for starting new businesses here at a price that are not possible in other metropolitan areas. So people are coming, classic story, Shinola, starting with bicycles and watches and now a whole lot of other things that yep. they do. Is that, a, is that a really, uh, is that a scalable proposition? Is that, is that happening in a real sense? I was, I was here for a family wedding some weeks ago and uh, months ago, I guess, and, and, and Saturday we went to the market downtown. I was, I was just blown away by the number of young people wearing Detroit t-shirts and Detroit sweatshirts. Yeah. I mean, it, it, was a, it was an almost a palpable sense of pride in the city. Tell me that story. Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenal city. People love Detroit. They're, they're proud of Detroit. Uh, it has just an a, a incredible work ethic, uh, uh, a never-say-die attitude. Uh, and we, you know, we've seen um, the foot traffic and everything that's happening in the city continuously expand. The answer to your question is yes. I mean, the reality is what, what I think we're gonna continue to focus on as an organization, there's really four main pillars for us. There's education, uh, there's entrepreneurship, there's neighborhood stabilization. Um, and as we start thinking about pulling all those things together, business, creating businesses, entrepreneurship, making sure that people in Detroit have the opportunity to, to develop those businesses. We're gonna be focused there. Um, there's gonna be a lot of time, effort, and energy focused on workforce development. We're in the process right now of, of uh, putting together $2.1 billion worth of uh, development downtown. There are not enough construction trades. Uh, when I talk to the automotive suppliers, there are not, a, not enough skilled trades workers. So how do we start developing those, those skills? Um, technology, coding. I was literally on the way down here listening to the radio and, and every day you hear about another organization that's figuring out how to start teaching uh, the youth of America and um, underemployed people how to code because the future is technology. We're seeing mobility happening all the time. The automobile industry is continuing to push towards mobility. So how do we take the talent that we have in this city, teach it and train it for the jobs that are available? Hmm. Um, because the reality is Detroiters uh, uh, are gonna be a part of this comeback and we're gonna figure out ways to be able to coach, teach, train, develop the right job skills necessary for the development that continues to happen here. I mentioned earlier that um, it's been a kind of a tri-party comeback. Uh, and of course, Kresge and Rip Rapson have led the philanthropic sector uh, and, and Quicken uh, acknowledged as the leader and, and others are following on the, on the business side. Tell me about the public sector and Mayor Duggan. Obviously the right guy for the right time. He was a, 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 a fellow who turned around the healthcare system here mm -hmm. uh, and then ran for mayor. 
um, uh, first, uh, first white uh, person to run for mayor and win the position in probably four decades. Um, uh, and, and it was a sense that, you know, the person who could do the turnaround job was the person who was needed. Tell us about him just as a person and your observations of the kind of leadership he's brought. So, I mean, Mayor Duggan is a, uh, he's just a go-getter type of individual. He puts his mind to something and he wants to go try to make it better. Um, you know, he, he took over the role coming out of the bankruptcy. Um, I think he's focused tremendously on city services and bringing those city services back, whether that be, I mean, it's just things as simple as street lights, um, response times for um, police and, and fire, um, and, and making sure that people show up when, when uh, folks are called on. I think he's developed a tremendous uh, ability for the public-private partnerships to exist. Um, and helped uh, really create kind of an economic development opportunity within the city of Detroit. You're seeing more and more people coming in and wanting to participate in developments in the city of Detroit. Um, you know, as I said, we're working on our own uh, version of that. The, the old Hudson site um, has been just, you know, there's been nothing there for a long, long time. Uh, we're, we're hopefully going to start putting a shovel in the ground there um, in December to start build, bringing that back. So I think he's, you know, he's been able to. Um, bridge the gap uh, of what's happening in the community between the, the public, the private, I mean, the philanthropic community in this neighbor, in this, in this town are phenomenal. They do a great job of helping out. So, you know, I think the mayor, I mean, obviously just got reelected by a, a very, very large margin. Um, so I think that, you know, the voters are telling him that he's doing a good job as well, but there's still obviously a lot of work to do as he's committed to uh, the neighborhoods. Um, you know, obviously education is still something that we're continuing to build and focus on. There's a new school superintendent for the public schools, which I believe, uh, you know, folks are excited about what he can bring because he's turned the schools around in Jacksonville. He's got the history to be able to do that. So you know, I think he's, he's tried to bring people together to, to start working on solutions. Um, and I, I've, I think we've seen more collaboration in this region mm. um, recently uh, than we ever had. And, 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 Which was know. really, really contentious before. I mean, yeah. Detroit versus the suburbs was, uh, it was probably the worst in the country. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I still, I, it, it was, I still think there's some work to do there, but I think we're starting to pull that together because everybody realizes that the region uh, needs to be part of the solution and, you know, how do we work together to make that happen? You know, I think the, the Amazon bid is, is a great example of that. We'll talk about that. That's, uh, of course, every city in the country is, you know, trying to get Amazon. Uh, they have 50, uh, 80,000 jobs in Seattle and it's changed Seattle. Right and they realized that they couldn't put more people in Seattle for one company, so they're looking to create a, a facility for 50,000 people somewhere else. Right. Are, is Detroit seriously in the bidding for that? It's not if, it's when. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, that'd be something. Uh, you know, we have a saying in, in our organization, you will see it when you believe it, so if you got, you gotta go in believing, right? I mean, um, yeah, I, I think we're in the running. I mean, you know, when you think about Detroit, what Detroit has to offer, um, when you think about everything that's happening in this city, uh, when you think about the central location uh, of, in the country, when you think about an international border across the river, where else in America can you look south and see Canada, <laughs> right? So, I mean, there, there's, there's that opportunity that exists, I think, here um, equally, if not more than anywhere else. So, you know, we'll see where this goes. Um, if we don't win it, it won't be for a lack of effort. But, but what I will tell you is that when you bring 60 different human beings from this region together, from the public sector, from the private sector, from the state, from the local government, from the philanthropic community, and you watch them work together for something that is good for this region, 50,000 jobs coming here, yeah. Amazon having a second headquarters 60 here. 60 people is the task force that's working yeah, on just this. The, you know, that the, the kind of work together to put this together. You know, it, it just shows you what's possible yeah. in this community when we come together. So I had an interesting conversation with the mayor about two months ago, uh, and, and I, I, was, I was expected him to talk about the people that are coming and the growth that is occurring, but he wanted to talk about doing things for the people that are here. Yeah. I thought it was a really interesting, uh, you know, idea, and I didn't know, I mean, maybe that's just the line that you use uh, because you're elected locally and those are the people who are gonna vote in an election, uh, or, or, or whether there's a, a real strategy there that says, no, I gotta take care of the people who are here. And he used words like, they stayed with us, they had faith in us. Talk about that dichotomy, if you will, as yeah, between I, traditional, you know, yeah. import, import businesses and people versus the folks who are, who are here. Well, as I said earlier, I, I don't think you can have a successful city without, but without both. You've got, you've got to make sure that there's a strong business community that can help generate tax revenue that goes into the communities and allows for services to be, continue to be, be paid for, but you have to have 
uh, that the folks that are in this town, that have stayed in this town, have every, uh, they deserve every opportunity to be a part of this. And we, we're committed to that as an organization. I think the mayor is, I, you know, I, I take him at his word when he says that. I think he is passionate about it. Um, and I think, you know, we're continuing to find ways to be able to um, work within the, the, the structures of, of what's happening in the neighborhoods uh, and continuing to focus on things that matter. Like as I said, job creation. I mean, the number one thing to solve for, um, for poverty is creation of jobs. And, and there's an opportunity for us to do that in a big, big way. And, and I know we're, we're focused on that and committed to that. Um, you know, we interact with the neighborhoods on a regular basis. We've put, you know, a couple hundred million dollars in the time we've been down here in a variety of different um, things and, and, and invested in, into those communities. So we're gonna keep doing that. I know the mayor's committed to doing that. I think the rest of the community, again, I think you're starting to see more and more um, collaboration around things that will make this entire city yeah. um, a, a strong, vibrant city. So sensitive subject, but you know, I think most people view it as part of the dynamic of Detroit of the last 40 years, and that is race relations, mm -hmm. both within the city, the city and its suburbs, and there have been periods when it was very, very raw. Uh, Mayor Coleman Young on his tenure actually seemed to pick fights with some of the suburban leadership on race. Uh, but Mayor Archer was criticized as being too accommodating to the business community at the, at the, at the cost of some popularity in, in, in the African-American neighborhoods. Um, and, and we, we just saw a movie this summer about the riots here and the, and the, the really ugly police incident back in the, in the 60s. What, what is the tenor, and more importantly, what's the direction of um, racial dialogue and equity in Detroit? Uh, so listen, I still think it's, a, it's a, a challenge in the city of Detroit. I think that it's a, it's a topic that will continue to, to be discussed. I think equity is the right way to think about this. Um, you know, how, do we, how is it equitable? How do we make sure that we help um, everybody create equity uh, that, that are that folks that are living here? I think, again, I've talked a little bit about that for creation of business and creation of jobs. It, it's, it's critical to be able to do that. Um, but, you know, I mean, even the stuff in the work that we've been doing, you know, we, we still hear about um, how uh, we're, you know, we're only focused on downtown and we're not committed to the neighborhoods. And, mm -hmm. and nothing could be further from the truth. But I also think it's a communication process, too. I mean, you know, we have to do a better job of talking about the things that we're doing. We have to, we've been doing a much better job of interacting with the communities. Um, we've been going out and, and sitting down with community leaders and understanding what's going on in their areas. Mm -hmm. How can we be helpful as an organization? Uh, I think more of that is starting to happen, but you know, I mean, it, it, it's it's you don't you don't solve um, 40 or 50 years worth of um, systems and processes that have happened in a four or five or six year period. You start building the foundation, you start building the building blocks, and and as we continue to do that, and it, we need to continue to look forward. We need to learn from the past, but we need to start um, that conversation of how we go forward together and help uh, improve what's happening in the city. You know, it's an interesting thing um, over the years. I've, and this is a kind of a practical question of on the ground. Um, Detroit had 200, 2 million people. When you shrink down to 650 million people, that means there's a lot of open space. Yeah. Uh, and in Detroit, it's taken the form of uh, houses that are burned in neighborhoods. And so you've got maybe two houses on what was once six houses on a block right. and whole neighborhoods that are, that are empty. It's like prairie out toward the Gross Point Park uh, line out Jefferson Avenue. So the, 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 um, the question is, how do you patrol? How do you provide schools? How do you provide city services? And what do you do with that land? There have been proposals from everything from parks to um, uh, urban farming. Um, and and, and all, what, what's your thoughts about that? Do you have any thoughts at all about kind of just the physical? Because what happens in Detroit on this question is going to be important to other places that have shrunk, like Youngstown and Pittsburgh and many others in the in the heartland. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, I think it's a great question. You've got 140 square miles of this city. It's a very, very large, sprawling city, and, and you've got a lot of areas that, uh, that don't have um, a whole lot that are going on. I think, you know, um, trying to figure out that the areas that have the opportunity to start building density again and, and building walkable, livable spaces. Uh, I just saw some renderings the other day on, on some neighborhoods where um, where, where homes have been knocked down, and you've got a, an open landscape starting to build uh, parks in those areas where people can come together because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, place uh, activation, activating public spaces is, is critical for people in, in a neighborhood to be able to get together and do things. I think one of the, the, uh, one of the areas that we, GM, DTE, and the Skillman Foundation are focused on is Cody Rouge. It's a neighborhood um, that, that uh, has been looked at and focused on. How do we look at a neighborhood holistically and we look at 
uh, neighborhood stabilization, we look at the commercial corridor, we look at education, we look at removing uh, blight and being able to put homes back up again. And, and, I, and I think the mayor's looked at this too. There's, there's areas and neighborhoods around, uh, around the city where you can start to build out a little bit of a concentration of a, of a real community that, that has retail businesses, small businesses interacting with the community, the ability to walk. Blight is a big piece of that, right? Kids feel, feeling safe walking through the neighborhoods. Um, you know, I think public transportation is something that we continue to, to think about in this, uh, in this region. The Regional Transit Authority, I think, would be tremendously helpful to be able to start coordinating some of that uh, public transportation, and I think we've got a lot of work to do there. So, um, you know, I mean, that's, I think, it's, it's really hard to, to go out into every single area. I mean, I think a lot of times, we, we've talked about this, you want to get focused and you want to find the right areas to be able to help. You want to try to help as many people as possible. Uh, and I think, you know, how do you, how do you leverage what's there and start building out and, and showing people what's possible? Because momentum builds upon momentum. Uh, tell us about you. Uh, what, what do you. What's your thinking about, you know, your involvement in Detroit? How long are you going to be doing this? How long is Quicken going to be working in this level of intensity in Detroit? Uh, you're a young man. You've got decades of work yet ahead of you. What, what? <laughs> That's what, what might be the kindest thing I've heard about me in ever, forever. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I turned 55 in December, so yes, there's a little bit of runway left for me. Um, but as an organization, um, we're committed to this. We're passionate about this. Um, you know, we have, I mean, we're all in. We've invested uh, to, to date um, close to three and a half to three and a half to four billion dollars of profits generated by the, the, the large family of organizations. We've got another 2.1 billion dollars of investment going into uh, developments that we know will bring more people to the city. We know will bring more travelers to the city. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're working diligently with other organizations, and I think that's important. The partnerships that exist publicly, privately, philanthropically, we just, the, uh, the city just recently organized a, 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 a sports commission yeah. to be able to go out and start recruiting sporting events. I understand the, the one city. distinction of Detroit right this minute, it's the only city in America where all four major pro teams play downtown. The Lions play downtown, the Tigers play downtown, the Pistons have come back, yep. and the Red Wings play. In yeah, the same so, so Detroit does now have a basketball team. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's not. Well, the one, Auburn, of days, not one of these days, one of these days, it'll get a football team. <laughs> well, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, time out, time out, time out. So you know what? So we were talking about this earlier, and, and one of the questions was, well, you know, what are the odds that the, that the uh, Lions win a Super Bowl in the next ten years? I said, so wait a minute, hang on, hang on, look at this. So um, the Cubs hadn't won a World Series in a hundred years. Yeah, so that right. would be Cleveland. That would be twenty-one seventeen. Years. Yeah, I, it's common. <laughs> it's common. You gotta believe in these things. I was believing all the, everything you were talking about the future of Detroit till you got to the Lions winning the Super Bowl. Listen, if you're in Detroit, you're a Lions fan. It doesn't matter. You you just you get sucked in every year, right? You're just you're passionate about it, and then you see how it unfolds. And unfortunately, it hasn't unfolded the way we want it. But you know, so, not, that's what that's that's what it means to be a die-hard fan. Yeah. Well, the city's fortunate to have Dan Gilbert and you and, and people like you in the business community, uh, which is so real. And I don't think I know anything like this in the country where, uh, you know, a, a company has invested this intensity. And there's a lot of lead companies in a lot of lead cities, but uh, 90 buildings and, and, and that, that don't, that from when you started, it, it was not an economic strategy. It was a, it was a philanthropic yes. commitment uh, to the city. We would be remiss in having you as the, 15-year CEO of Quicken, not to say a word about the national uh, mortgage environment sure. and economic environment for housing at the moment. You heard the presentation earlier. What are your this thoughts about where we're headed on uh, home ownership, mortgage environment uh, in the country? So, I, you know, listen, I think on the mortgage space, um, we've come through an incredible um, regulatory uh, re refit, restart. Um, I actually think that some of the stuff that's been done is tremendously effective and, and having an underwriting standard matters. Um, you know, you're seeing uh, entities be able to digest that and continue to build and grow. Um, when I think about the mortgage landscape technology and how that plays into it, um, companies are really waking up to the fact that the millennial generation is the largest generation in history and they are gonna be the home buyers to, of today and tomorrow and we have to be able to serve them differently. Um, and you, so you wrote out the, the, the big mortgage crisis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, how, how, how did you do that? How, how did you not get drawn into the, the well, you know, the, 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 the kinds of mortgages that were being made uh, yeah. that, that took companies down? 
you know, I, I'd like to tell you that we're just incredibly, incredibly smart and we did all the right, <laughs> but it's a little, literally a lot of the things we didn't do, right? I yeah. mean, so we didn't get ourselves uh, involved in a lot of the products and programs yeah. that drove um, what happened from and the marketplace perspective. And why not? Because you, you, you saw the, the toxic nature yeah. of them? Yeah, I just, it just didn't make sense for our business model. It wasn't what we were looking to do. Um, you know, we knew we had a, a But I would have thought a smallish, at that point, not well-known mortgage company would take advantage of some of those products that everybody else was doing to get market share, to, to grow faster. It's a, it, that comes down to a culture and a philosophy, right? Really? And, and so it, and it, it bleeds into even what we're doing here. It's just simple, do the right thing. Yeah. Do the right thing, do the right thing for your business, do the right thing. Think about the, 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 the team members that you have in the organization. Think about how they have to show up every single day, the reputation that they carry forward for you. Do things that will help them. So you survived. People. Stage yeah. and came out strong, Stronger, and and your sure. your your major growth has been since. Yes. Right. Yes. And uh, what, what's what is your dynamic? What's the dynamic since? Are you back now to offering a, a whole range of products that, uh, that Rocket Mortgage is new, right? Rocket Mortgage is a delivery system um, to be able to empower people to understand what they're doing with their mortgage transaction through technology. It's not, it, it, the underwriting box that exists today, whether that be the Fannie, Freddie, FHA, uh, VA, it is what it is. We're, we're doing nothing with that. Okay. Um, the reality is that is the mortgage market today. There's very little private uh, money, and I know and Pinto talks about this all the time, right? There's, there's no private label security market. So we are, we are building and living within an underwriting environment that exists today, and we are just asking ourselves, how do you deliver to a consumer in a better, more efficient, more transparent, more effective way and by the way, a safer way for the industry, a safer way for the end investor, because we import data and information directly from the source. There is no paper. We're not asking anybody to produce um, you know, a, a paper that if they wanted to, to document differently, they could. Um, and by doing that, you're able to really change the efficiency curve of how mortgages are done, the availability of mortgages. When you think about the millennial generation and how everybody interacts, everybody, everybody's got one of these. My 10-year-old has one of these. I mean, he's, he's better at this than I am. And that's how people are really interacting. So you've got to embrace that uh, if you really want to be able to serve the, the, the majority of, of what you're doing from a home ownership perspective. What, uh, what's the future of Quicken? Is it, it's basically going to be a mortgage company for the long haul. I know my notes say you're the second largest mortgage deliverer in the country. Yep. Who's number one? Wells Fargo is number one. Does it matter that, 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 that I mean, you're headed to number one or is, is this a good place to be? And, aren't, uh, we always, aren't we always trying to be I don't know. number one? I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 was, I, was, I grew up on a football field. My dad was a high school football coach. So, you know, and you learn how to be competitive and, and win. Yeah, I think you're always driving to be number one. But if you're not number one in volume, what can you be number one in? Yeah. And we're number one in client satisfaction. J.D. Power, eight years in a row on the origination side. The quality of what we produce, um, all of the metrics that Fannie, Freddie, uh, FHA look at, and the quality of the loans that we deliver, the, the, it, that's critically important to us because we want to be able to build sustainable home ownership for people in this country, sustainable home ownership for people in this town, mm -hmm. and you have to do that the right way. And we've seen the outcome of what, when you don't do it the right way. Right. And, and you know, it's just. It's Are you in all DNA. 50 states? We're absolutely in all 50 states. Yeah. Impressive. Um, let's take some questions. We have some time for some questions from the floor. Obviously, we've got a wonderful resource here of a person who knows business, built a business in this sector but also uh, has done a yeoman's job of helping rebuild a community. Thoughts or comments? Any, any questions question out there? In the right middle. here. Henry? Uh, you've spoken in depth about the philanthropic ventures in terms of economic development and recovery. Can you talk a little bit about what borders mean in terms of city versus county, um, you know, state versus state as it relates to economic development? The and, question was what housing. is missing? Oh. No, can you talk about what borders mean between borders, borders. What between borders the city mean? and the and the suburbs for example i know you yeah. live outside of the city right great point um, great point if you can just talk about that that'd be helpful from a housing strategy thanks um you know i mean i, I think we're you know from a housing we're, we don't build houses we're not it's not what we do we're not in the real estate space from a residential perspective although we do have a um a, a real estate company that does that deals with res, residential lending uh, I mean, I think the you know borders are an interesting uh, conversation, right? And and we talked a little bit about Detroit and then and what's happening from a suburb perspective. I mean, there's always been that yin and yang, and and it still exists, but I, I think it's improving. But when we think of, when we think about it, um, we are a, we're a vehicle to help from a home ownership perspective nationally because we provide financing to do that. 
Um, but when we think about uh, Detroit, you know, we're thinking about it holistically um, from, the, from, from the land development to um, how do you build something that's scalable. I, just talk, I talked about our Rehab and Ready program uh, that's helped 80, diff 80 homes. We're figuring out a way to scale that, right? Um, but, you know, I, I think, I, I don't think about it from state to state. I don't think about it from that perspective, but I do think we're, we're trying to understand the dynamic county to county and, and what's yeah. happening in the local area. You've got a, an interesting, and maybe you can paint this picture, an interesting juxtaposition of Detroit, the central city, then some very much older suburbs, some of which are very distinct, mm -hmm. large immigrant populations in some of those inner suburbs. And then you have some of the wealthiest suburbs in America in Bloomfield Hills and places like that. Um, I've often thought that the way to think about a metro area is what you see when you land at night in an airplane, mm -hmm. which is just an aggregation of lights and you really can't see where the boundaries are. Right. It's just one economic organism. And Detroit, you know, functions that way now more than before because so much of the, 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 the automotive jobs are out in the suburbs and people have to get out to them as opposed to, you know, just down the block, down the, in the neighborhood. So the integrity of the region as a whole, the, the, the overarching governance structures that allow people to work together is really important. Yeah, I think it is. And I think one of the, the examples uh, that, that where that, that uh, interplay exists is in transit, right? And, and the reality of needing a regional transit authority that can actually think about transit holistically so that we have the ability to connect what's happening in Detroit to the suburbs and give people um, the opportunity to not have to drive their vehicle into a city uh, the efficiency gain that happens from that, I mean, there's an efficiency gain that's already happened as a result of technology and your ability to work in different places and different spaces. Um, but if you could take your, you know, if you're walking to work, phenomenal. And you've heard a great presentation about walkability and how you build around that last night. But if you are in your car or you are, you have a 20 minute commute, wouldn't it be better to sit on public transportation somehow that functions and works and brings people into the city and, and, and be able to do that? So I think that that's a great example of how we have to do a better job of working together as, as a region. Yep, important to create the mechanisms where people can talk across the region, and I, I know that that's been a major priority here. Yes? Uh, thank you. I have a two-part question. Uh, the first is that uh, most of the investment that is occurring downtown is in what's known as a tax increment finance area, uh, the DDA. That's a tax capture, and a lot of that development it's heavily subsidized uh, through tax abatements and, and uh, uh, other packages that basically come uh, out of the public uh, purse. <clears throat> uh, that model is uh, over four decades old because the taxes that are generated inside that DDA uh, stay in that DDA. They're not distributed typically uh, in the rest of the city. Uh, is that still uh, a good model for development. Uh, how long do you think uh, private businesses will need that level of tax subsidies uh, going forward in the future? Second okay. question. All right, let, let's deal with the first question if we can. Thank you. So, so um, I am, I, I'd love to tell you I'm an expert on, on tax increment financing. I am not. I can tell you that that's the legislation that exists today. Um, and, and I can tell you that the processes and the projects that we're working through is, is capturing future taxes. Um, we're, we're investing the money to get to a place where we can do all of these things. We're not capturing um, Detroit taxes. We're not, we're not impacting schools. We're capturing taxes on future uh, jobs that are created and future state income taxes. And it's, so it's really a state incentive to be able to find ways to, in, in, uh, to, to help people develop on, on sites that otherwise would not be economically viable to develop. Uh, and so, I, you know, whether there's a better system or a better way to do that, I don't know. Um, but from a, 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 the ability to build transformational prop buildings and take sites that wouldn't otherwise be developed on and help, because it, ultimately then you start bringing more people to a city, you, you start having more city income tax, and, and the numbers that we've looked at and, and the developments that we're talking about over that period of time, generating over $600 million of a, a, additional tax revenue for the city of Detroit by doing that development. We can take your, your second question if it's brief, sir. Uh, certainly. Uh, second question is uh, uh, regarding opportunities for affordable housing for uh, low and moderate uh, income buyers. Uh, the way things have, have gone in Detroit, uh, most of the money that was allocated from uh, the federal government through the hardest hit fund was used for demolition of a lot of residential structures, uh, many of which uh, were never 
uh, ascertained for their structural soundness of whether or not they could be uh, uh, rehabbed uh, within the range of affordability for low uh, and moderate income buyers. Uh, do you see anything uh, uh, coming down in the future that's going to uh, provide those opportunities, particularly when there's so many companies uh, like your company that don't, uh, don't provide home repair loans Thank at you, those sir. rates? So, um, you know, I, all I can speak to is what we're doing from an affordable perspective. Again, we're not, we don't build homes. Um, we, we voluntarily uh, went into an agreement with the city to uh, take 20% of any of the uh, properties that we are going to build in the next uh, five, six, seven, eight years and make sure that they have, they're affordable. So any of the buildings that we are involved with, whether that be creating housing or preserving housing, um, I think we project over the next five years to create 3,500 um, residential units. So of those 3,500 residential units, 700 of them will be affordable and they will be, meet the affordable um, uh, test. So I know from our perspective, we're trying to do what we can in the developments that we're building uh, and throughout the city where we can either create or, or preserve uh, aff affordable housing units um, and part of our commitment to what we're doing in the city. I understand we have time for one question over here uh, at this other mic. This question is for both. Um, in 1994, when you became the HUD secretary, there was a question about gentrification when you came in office. So the question that I have for both, how do you address the critics that says that a lot of the developments that are happening in these urban cities are a process of gentrification and what is being done about that? Well, I'll, I'll be happy to start. Um, over the last several years, we've had the amazing phenomenon of cities that were in very, very bad shape suddenly having a different problem, which is um, in, incoming uh, young people, uh, driving up prices both for uh, uh, homes as well as, as, as rents and creating what we call gentrification. Uh, some foresighted mayors are doing important things about this. Uh, Mayor Kasim Reed in Atlanta, uh, for example, has started a pilot program where uh, that essentially freezes taxes on people who have lived for a, a number of years in their home in a neighborhood where others are coming in and raising the value of everything around them so that those people's property taxes go up and they cannot stay in their home. There was the problem of elderly people who had no mortgage, they'd already paid out their homes, they owned them, but the taxes were rising at a rate that they would not be able to stay in the homes. So Mayor Reed has created some districts of Atlanta, which is growing as a downtown, growing as a city, it's reversed the trend of out-migration, and actually uh, 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 rising in value. They have a tremendous growth rate there. Uh, from industries and corporations and others. And so he's got several neighborhoods established as pilot pro programs to specifically counter gentrification. So those are the kinds of things that, 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 that cities are thinking about in this new environment. I was in Seattle a few weeks ago and uh, the, the, Amazon is generally a blessing, but 80,000 workers in the downtown can also be a curse and it's just raised the prices so that the homeless rate has exploded in Seattle and people cannot afford to, to, to live there. So they're having to think through what are the nature of strategies to keep people who were there and not, and not, not completely change the internal dynamics of the city. So those are the kinds of things that, that uh, can be done. Any thoughts about that sort of thing you know, here? I, I think you're much more eloquent uh, than I am. So, um, but I, 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 think you're, I think you're right on the things you're pointing out. And I think it's obviously a, something that we'll continue to, to work through uh, in the city of Detroit. Uh, but I, th I also think it's incumbent upon uh, business and the community to be inclusive and to think through how we do things. Um, and there are, there are certainly things that we can do to make sure that we are giving opportunity for everyone. And I'm, I'm still gonna go back to the ability to, to, to coach, teach, train, the skilled trades, the things that are necessary to create opportunities for Detroiters to get into organizations or organizations in this city that have entry points um, if we can teach and, and give the right skills to people. And that ultimately is what gives people the opportunity to participate. I mentioned earlier um, in my conversation with Mayor Duggan some months ago, that's what he wanted to talk about. He wanted to talk about how Detroit's improvements uh, can be harnessed to work for the people who are here now. I thought that was a very, you know, insightful way for a mayor to be talking about it. Because usually you'd hear a mayor say, well, we're growing at this rate, we're bringing this many people in, we have these many businesses coming in, et cetera. That wasn't the metric he wanted to be graded by. He wanted to grade it.